everyone loves happy hour. And no one makes an hour happier than actress, comedian, author, host, and self-proclaimed hat girl, Dee Dee Sorvino, who each show serves up an hour of good times and great conversation. Food, culture, fashion, current events, history, or just good gossip. Grab a cocktail and take a seat as Dee Dee shares stories, talks with friends, and makes you wish you could keep the bar tab open all night. Where there's a party, there's Dee Dee, and you are invited. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Drinks with Dee Dee. Here's your host, Dee Dee Sorvino. Ah, bonjour, bonjour. Welcome to Drinks with Dee Dee. Today we're talking about Bastille Day because you know what? It's Bastille Day. What else are we going to talk about? I mean, there's all kinds of things going on in America, but let's, you know, let's get off our problems and talk about the French and how their pro- a lot of their problems started so we feel better about them ourselves. <laughs> Welcome. Bonjour. Again, I'm your host, Didi Sorvino, a uh, host of Drinks with Didi. And, you know, when you get started, you can't stop. It's like that first drink and you just keep drinking and drinking and drinking. And then you're like with us for every podcast. So welcome. Uh, there is since it's called Drinks with Didi, you know, you have themes and we get off of them many times. We're only on it for a minute and we'll talk about other things because we talk about whatever the heck. It's like a bar. It is a bar. It's a virtual bar. So everybody gets into whatever and, you know, we just let it roll. And we always have drinks. So there's always an official drink. So guess what? For Bastille Day. Okay, what else? What else am I going to have? But champagne. Ooh. And, you know, I always love a an excuse to have champagne. One of my favorite drinks. So food Clicquot, which is always a ringer. So let's have a pour. And you know, without further ado, let's bring in the guest. Let's 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 bring in our friends. Ah, friends, it's amis, I believe. Because I will butcher, you know, I love French. Their language is so beautiful. French and Italian both. And I just can't do it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael, for ruining the mood. But you know you always do, so it's okay. So bravo, bravo, bravo. (laughs) Hey, Vienna. That's my French song. That's my French song. I don't know. Your French schlong? Your French schlong? Is that what you say? (laughs) Oh, they would like that. Do you have a strap on? Are you that? I mean, I don't want to know, but are you that pathetic? I mean, you know, you have to have a strap on. I I, I love your wife. Gosh, I hope she doesn't Schwang. have to deal with that mess. Schwang. <laughs> well, welcome, uh, Michael, and welcome, Michael, bam, and Stephanie. So, uh, you know, we're talking about Bastille Day, and I thought it'd be fun because, you know, it's really complicated, actually. The French Revolution, for a lot of people, just thinking, oh, the French went in and they just, you know, went to the Bastille, they took out all the bad guys, and they, but it, it really is much more complicated than that, and I have a beret that just want to stay on, but you know, you know I had to wear a beret today, but it looks good if it stays on, if it falls off, so be it. I think that uh, it's good for us to have history lessons and have fun with it here, because I have a history degree, so it's like I feel, you know, here and there, we've got to go there, uh, not just drinking and slumming and you know making fun of amber heard and all that but we'll do that but i'm thinking why don't we make fun of the french for a while or celebrate with them whatever or a little bit of both so stephanie I'm cake well of course you are marie let them eat cake you're doing what marie you're doing what marie you're a good peasant what is it michael <laughs> proletariat you're a good member of the proletariat am i right here we the, the we <laughs> oh you're a plebeian is that how you say pleb? it? Yeah. You're a pleb. Yeah. Pleb. I, I don't yeah. know if that, that, I can't remember what the French, it would be, all right. No, he's peasants. a plebeian, right? Pleb would be the peasants, right, Michael? Yeah, See, my yeah, BAM's so, really. Yeah. That would be Roman. That would be Roman. It I'm what the French the, call les incompetents. They called them the sans culottes, I believe. What is it, Mike? The sans culottes. Ah, oh, yeah. Without, yeah, the plebeians, that's right. They were the Roman. So I'm, I'm, you know, in too much in Italy. Yeah, they were. And, but the French did come up with the bourgeoisie. Oh, yeah. I love that word. The that word has had a resurgence in popular culture. People say bougie now. 
to mean fancy. Bourgeoisie. Toity toity. It's supposed to mean middle class and gauche and sort of, you know, that's what it, it is. And then, of course, there's the, the, the ruling class. You know, we're all, we'd be considered, we would be considered petit bourgeois. Well, of course, if we're if we all went to a drinks with Didi uh, trip in Paris, if we did episodes there, believe me, that is what they would be calling <laughs> bourgeoisie. <laughs> and I love American. it. Where's the toilet at? <laughs> Where's the they would, hate, they would hate this show. And in fact, you know, I have a few French friends, and everybody said no. Everybody. <laughs> Could not get anybody. But to be fair, they all said, oh, well, we're having a party. They really were all partying down. It's a Bastille Day is a big deal in France. Yeah, Although yeah. It, it reminds me of Cinco de Mayo. And Mike, I'd like for you to get into that because Cinco de Mayo, it kind of like really doesn't have the meaning you think it does. It's just like Bastille Day. It's really, you know, what they're celebrating kind of happened a year later in French history, but Bastille Day just sounds better, I guess. So, but Mike, I would love to get your take because Mike is brilliant when it comes to history. And many times he has different tastes, which is why I asked him to be on the program. You all might think it's even funny, but go ahead, Mike. What do you think about Bastille Day? <laughs> well, first of all, Cinco de Mayo, ironically enough, does have to do with the French. Uh, it celebrates you know it the, does. Battle of, <laughs> yes, it does, the Battle of Puebla. That's right. The, yeah. the Mexican revolutionaries defeated the French army in a battle. Now, this wasn't the conclusive battle of the French, um, of the war between uh, Emperor Maximilian and the French army and the Mexicans, the, um, the French would just leave on their own, kind of like what we did in Vietnam. Um, they weren't really defeated. They just weren't, were tired of having to go there. But nobody knows that. I knew it because I have a history degree and I have to know a few things like that. Mike knows it, but most Americans think it's Mexican independence. They just assume so Cinco de Mayo and it's not. This is what happens when you let a bunch of bars decide what's an important thing. Hey, hey, I'm on for it. <laughs> so, same with Bastille but, Day. It's kind of the same thing. Tell us well, why, Mike. Well, Bastille, well, Bastille Day is different. Bastille Day is like they, they turned a riot into a national holiday. I mean, they, the storming of the Bastille was a complete crock. They, were, they didn't have that many prisoners there at That's all right. at the time it got, it got overrun. They killed the poor Swiss guards who were there. Um, and why would you ever kill them? What did they do? Well, I mean, <laughs> they, were, they were. Well, you're dealing with a bunch of angry people, and su supposedly the Marquis de Sade egged them on to a degree. And um, he kind of allegedly had a lot to do with what happened by exaggerating what was going on in the Bastille. Truth be told, there were like two, a dozen or so people there at the most and the bastille served as both a fortress previously it was a palace as well that was one of the places before you had versailles you had uh in the louvre had served as a french palace the bastille had served as a castle for the french uh royalty before they moved uh to the west to versailles but bastille day is just a giant riot and i find it ironic that something that really set forth not a revolution but uh, it just did a little bit of math here since bastille day france has had five republics you had one fascist state during world war ii under patan you had two empires under napoleon the first and napoleon the third you had the restoration of the bourbon monarchy which bastille day you know was part of the trigger against the, the bourbons i heard Louis bourbon uh, All right, bourbon, had, yeah. <laughs> then you had the July monarchy of Louis Philippe in the House of Orleans. So all it did was just set off a, a chain of events where France was in this 200 years of turbulent history almost. And that's not counting the Paris Commune where they, bur where they burned the Tuileries. Most people don't realize this, but the Louvre used to be completely closed in. You had this large palace at the front of it called the Tuileries. And during the Paris Commune, the, the, the earliest iteration of the communists took it over when they tried to do their coup in Paris, and they, it got burned to the ground during the fighting. So uh, Edmund Burke 
not to get a little highbrow here, I know. No, I love Edmund Burke. Edmund Burke. I'm a Burke. I know who Edmund Burke is. Yeah, but great. Edmund Burke. I'm a uh, history major was, too. Was a big uh, <laughs> supporter of the American Revolution, but more importantly, unlike Thomas Jefferson, he was able to differentiate between the American Revolution on one side and the French Revolution on the other. Exactly. Now, now, most people, what they know about the French Revolution comes from A Tale of Two Cities, but if you want to see a kind of a glimpse of the spirit of the French Revolution, and I think it's one of the best movies uh, produced within the last 10, 15 years. It's actually a fairly uh, smart movie. The Dark Knight Rises, the last of the Christian Bale Batman movies. The, the mm -hmm. reign of Bane over Gotham is straight out of the French Revolution, where they had the tribunals, where people were brought up before uh, a, a fixed court and they were just executing everyone who appeared before them. That was essentially the spirit of the French Revolution. And one thing was it consumed a lot of the people who were the leaders of it. Uh, Danton was, was executed. Uh, Robespierre and his brother were both executed. No, so, but didn't he deserve it? He was oh, a crap. Well, 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 Dan, <laughs> that later, was karma. Dan Tom later found his faith on the way to the guillotine. I bet he did. The road <laughs> think... did. Right. A lot I mean, of people do. He was the devil. I mean, you know, he's like going home, man. Right. So I mean, it, uh, he better be headed in a better direction. I mean, yeah, but the friend, well, but you know, but my my point was that it's like single de mile because people really don't know what they're celebrating. You're right. It's the bards. It's like, hey, let's party. And and really, well, what they were talking I mean, about was in New Orleans, which has a big French history. Of course. They're, they're, Steel celebration consists of a waiter race with a bunch of waiters holding a tray, uh, a tray with a wine bottle in it, running back and forth. There's no, there's no really depth, uh, you know. Well, what's wrong know. with that? I think that's fantastic. Well, I mean, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's a, it's a rather, you know, uh, polite, benign way of looking at it. But, you know, the 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 Bastille Day and the French Revolution just ushered in really a tremendous amount of suffering and upheaval in the country. No doubt. All these executions. And it's funny to see something that was the spark of so many people dying turned into this benign holiday, almost like a militaristic 4th of July, because the idea of uh, President Trump doing this big military parade oh, boy, yeah. came from his trip to France with uh, President Macron, where he witnessed mm -hmm. their field day which is almost like something that you would see in Moscow in Red Square, where you'd have yeah. the military vehicles and the planes flying. And, and Trump was very impressed with that. And that's what he tried to create something along the lines around Veterans Day in the United States. And it just didn't take off. But you know, Bastille Day is, there's a, uh, there, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what happened and the significance of it. And part of that's indicative of our failing education system in America. You know, Sri Lanka really likes Bastille Day, I heard. <laughs> well, I mean, they celebrate Bastille Day like once a year there, the old-fashioned way. But, uh, <laughs> so Kurt there. joined us, guys. Kurt joined us, and he's been a little under the weather, so thanks for Bonjour. coming around. Uh, Hi. How you doing, Kurt? How you doing? I, I'm I'm waiting for my hernia replacement surgery to fix the last fix of the hernia, and today I had a kidney stone attack. So, oh. and the oh. man's still here. What a trooper! He 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 he's ready. Look, but if you're if, you know if you're going to have those things going on, you might as well have a drink or two with us. It'll make you feel better. <laughs> I mean, what else? What, what is there better to do? And that's yeah. why I think people join the podcast and just kind of want to forget what's going on for a little bit and listen to us rattle on about whatever the hell. Yeah. I mean, why not? Yeah. Oh, I yeah. thought I would nickname my bathroom the Bastille, and I kept storming it this morning. Oh, <laughs> but up! Uh, <laughs> I was doing that a, a couple of weeks ago. I Here we go. Time, and I was storming the Bastille big time. Yeah, it took about six minutes. It's usually a little longer for us to go way down or whatever. But so, Kurt. So yeah, just, you took my, just took my coming on. Notice I'm all. not adding <laughs> on. I'm not as too I know it's to usually Michael. It's not Kurt, but you know, hey, when you're not feeling well, and you know, you you are able to say whatever.
the heck you want because you're not you don't have one issue going on you got two so welcome and, and uh, what do you think bishop anyway you're so never going to be a bishop anyway that's always the joke with kurt because <laughs> otherwise he would be but after being on this show it's all over there will be no bishop for father kurt <laughs> well looking at what happened to the french bishops i'm not sure that's such a bad thing <laughs> oh no yeah. My no, goodness. No. So what do you think about Bastille Day? Are you celebrating by storming any doing anything else other than storming the best your own Bastille? <laughs> well, I, I, I will be doing uh, actually I'm, I'm at my office right now because I'm, I'm still teaching and we have an extra credit movie tonight. Uh, so it will be a little bit later before I can get home and, and uh, celebrate but I'm going to have a bottle of French wine. Uh, so, so uh, from my oh, friends, uh, I'm I'm going to have Chateau Margot. That is Ooh, nice uh, on on the list for tonight. Nice. Well, uh, I'm having champagne. I know you're shocked, but you know the Veuve Clicquot. <laughs> let me look any excuse for champagne. I'm in Veuve Clicquot. Love it. So sure. we might as well talk about what we're drinking. Having so a Versailles. Kurt, I'm having a Versailles drink. That would be bourbon from, bourbon. Uh, yeah, Woodford County and Ver Versailles, Versailles. Uh, you know, the you know, you call it Versailles. Yeah. I've got it. I've got a bottle of, you guys are going to die laughing. Because I drank is the it French stuff Trois, last night. the wine. Oh, is no. it? <laughs> no. This is in reference to wine. Marie Antoinette. This is in, uh, uh, in reference of uh, Marie Antoinette. It is a rosé. From Gonsbrunn, Austria. Yeah, she's Austrian. Okay. Most people don't know that. Uh, okay, yeah. Oh, oh I've had I not plenty of bottles of wine in Austria. So, yeah. Well, I knew that because so. I watched. I watched the Marie Antoinette, the old Marie Antoinette movie. It's so good, by the way. I think because you know, we should also talk about French movies that we like. Uh, Norma Shear. You know, these are the old black and white movies. Paul and I love them. They're so good. It was just so well done, but it, they made a big deal about her being an Austrian. And then it was just a great movie. So you all should check it out. So if you're, you know, and we should talk about, you know, if you're going to watch a French movie, what is it? I'll go ahead and say that would be my favorite. It's just, it, it's a long one, but it's really excellent. I mean, in the costumes, you know, they don't do that anymore. The big old movies with the big costumes and long and dramatic and you've got all these extras you know and now they just digitally kind of put people in there i think i think they're fake i think they're all green screen right pretty much a lot of them are yeah yeah a lot of them are. <clears throat> yeah. which is sad yeah. i love those yeah, old they, movies with cast of thousands they call it uh canvassing when you uh they take like a group of 20 to like to fill a theater and they just move the 20 across the whole thing oh, it's terrible and they keep the camera the same and they have you yeah it's not i mean it's hollywood golden age people are doing uppers and they're bouncing off the walls and there's two thousand of them and they're <laughs> it's like fountains and shit the producers doing blow yeah, you're <laughs> Let's get yeah. a thousand more people in and then there's like gold and stuff and ornate if they don't make them like that anymore no, they don't. I mean, they don't. They just kind of took and made something beautiful into something terrible, Michael. <laughs> I like the you golden age. Not. No, I knew it, but that was kind of focusing on the costumes and the extravagance of it and how no, cool it was. You know, I, You're yeah. right. Poor no, Judy Garland. Look what they did to Judy Garland. <laughs> Holy yeah. moly. She didn't, they didn't let the woman eat. I mean, she'd have to have like 21, 30 cigarettes a day and then they give her uppers to stay up and then give her the downers to sleep. It was really terrible. But yeah. Yeah. But that's what they did back in the day. And I still prefer that over green screen, though, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's more authentic. Well, you, can, hey. you, you can't you can't get over the costume costumings like that uh, Edith had. Unbelievable. She was she could come up with some stuff mm. that oh, was yeah. just jaw dropping. Mm. And I think she Marie Antoinette was one of those movies. If you check it out, you won't yeah. even believe it, the detail. So, Mike, so you you are expert on this, but you have a different twist. I think, you know, Kurt, well, actually, first I'd like to hear what Kurt thinks about uh, the, the uh, Stormy and the Bastille, Bastille Day. Do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think it was, in philosophy, a good thing that turned into a bad thing. It, it, the, the, the problem that we have in the French execution, and I use that word with a pun intended, of course, uh, of, of their revolutionary ideas 
is that they, they had the they were inspired in many ways by the same basic philosophical ideals that we had for our revolution, but they took it off in a sort of fantastical different direction, and it turned into much more of a mob rule rather than a, a consistent and and uh, educated democracy kind of way. And, and the storming of the Bastille and, and other kinds of things, I think that I think in many ways people in France were thinking that might be another Boston Tea Party, uh, which of course was much less violent and, and, and uh, much more more pointed. I had a friend uh, several years ago, we went to Paris and the one thing he wanted to do was storm the Bastille and he was just so disappointed mm -hmm. when he got there. And of course it's not there anymore. Uh, it, it's gone. And he's like, what? what do you mean it's gone? What do you mean it's gone? How did That's they get rid of the Bastille? It's ridiculous. Well, well because what, what, they, what? They make it into a McDonald's? I mean, why no, would you no, do no. that? I mean, it, it, it was literally torn down during this revolutionary period. That, 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 was, that was part of it. That, they, that tracks. That, that tracks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and, and so hmm. I, I think there's a McDonald's not far near, <laughs> not too <laughs> far right now. Uh, but uh, I mean, if there were two Burger Kings on the Champs Elysees when I was there, so which so is terrible. Not, they should be banned. But but but, uh, but yeah, whatever. Yeah. But 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 yeah, it it's what what it was was see releasing the prisoners from the Bastille, getting rid of the excesses of the the uh, royal and the and the the, the feudal master class, uh, because feudalism lasted a little longer in France than it did in much of the rest of Europe. And uh, yeah. it, it was it was really time for it to go, but instead of gradually drifting away, it, it had this this kind of violent thing. But this the the release of the prisoners was one thing. The destruction of the prison itself was another. And I think that in some ways is indicative of the whole of that portion of the French Revolution. They were not just getting rid of the the bad stuff. They were essentially getting rid of everything. It's like, like, burn it all down and let's see what's left over. And when you get into that kind of mindset, it just, it just goes on a roll. It's, it's like a, a, a chain reaction of fission or, or uh, uh, it, it, you, you just, you can't stop it once it starts. And that's yeah, why they, people... Just like back to Gladiator days. I mean, people are like loving it. They wanted to watch it, yeah. you know, and the guillotine, bring out the guillotine. I mean, it, it, that was yeah. the entertainment of the day. And once you're done was with all a, the aristocrats, you have to keep it going. So you start chopping up your own followers and start chopping yeah, up your yeah. own leaders. And 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 so so it's like all all the people who were the leaders originally ended up <laughs> essentially gone there, by the end as well. Uh, there was a uh, I think a systematic systemic uh, vindictiveness going on. Yeah, and it's so different from what we did. It, our, ours was a war of independence. We're like, you know, just leave us alone. We're not going to pay our taxes. Okay, here's a bunch of tea in the harbor. A bunch of drunk Bostonians dressed up like Indians. You know, but that was it. To the point, it's, I get why they were doing this. I don't get the grinding up of everybody and everybody and the innocent people that were caught. Yeah, that just, that's why I look at it and cringe a little bit. Just but don't you think bit. it was like during the pandemic and during like whenever people were like burning cities down and just, you know, they just started a frenzy and started going crazy. I mean, I think that's they what can, moms do. Yeah, that's what moms do. That's what they evolve into. And if you let it go, let it go. Like, well, you know, <laughs> and then there's nothing left. So guess what you get? You get an emperor. <laughs> yeah. or or two or worse you know so that's what happens and the thing with, with the american revolution and, and mike can help me with this you know that was what was the beauty of edmund burke i mean he explained it all so well and i had a class in our college american revolution excuse me french revolution and i was the only dissenter in class everybody else thought the french revolution was good i said no <laughs> it was not good it was very bad I thought it was terrible. I thought it was poorly planned out. It didn't work well. It was just like, no, so I got an A in the class. No, but you know, I think it was strange, but I was a little older than the, because I had to go back a couple of times for school to finish. So these yeah. young kids just didn't get it. They thought, yeah, let's just burn the house down. It's okay. 
I think when you get a little older, you, you kind of look at things differently. Maybe because yeah, maybe, I'm a right winger. Uh, but yeah. the, I was amazed that the entire class was like, yeah, French Revolution. That was great. Every single one of them. It's, it's, it's amazing to me. I after, When I got sick, I left school. I had to go. I had to leave school for three years. I came back. I was older. I did yeah. take French, French history. And when she was talking about that, I'm looking at the kids going, now, before I got sick, I would agree with that because I, I just, again, it comes naturally to me to, to cringe at that stuff. And you know, Kurt and Bloomington, and, uh, they're all going to be for the French Revolution. <laughs> those kids yeah. in those classes, it's pretty liberal. <laughs> well, well, yeah, see, see, here's the thing. And I'm going to, I'm going to irritate the hell out of almost all of my liberal friends now. So, so, so watch, watch this as I and say. And the bishop, the, so why not, why not include the liberals too? <laughs> yeah, the, I, I, I think the spirit of the Bernie bros was, is the spirit of the reign of terror of the Ugh. French Revolution. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah you're like, right. if we can't, if we can't have our yeah. way, we'll burn it all down. Yeah, you're right. If yeah, totally. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and, and they, they, they wouldn't support people even on their own side if they couldn't get exactly their way. Yeah, that we. I mean, you see that in so many places, and it's in so many different groups, and it's it really is. It's it's well, almost what's missing, like it's disease guys? What's missing? that takes over. But what's missing? The problem there's no law and order. <laughs> so yeah. it's just it's just not no law and order, and there's no there's no end. There's there's no why there's are you a doing vacuum it? because we're starving. We're starving. Yeah, the, okay. the American Revolution, there was a plan. I mean, there was a yeah. detailed, wonderful plan. There were there were documents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, was, plan. there was there was restraint. Mm -hmm. The difference yeah. between the American Revolution and the French Revolution was the American Revolution was about building something. The French Re Revolution was about destabilizing and destroying something. Yeah. One was and, about advancement, the other one was about vengeance. Yeah. And they got plenty of what they had coming to them when the Franco-Prussian War happened, because then that started all sorts of other things. And the Prussians not only beat the living, you know what, out of the French, they basically united Germany. So you've got a country brand new with no idea of what democracy is led by a militaristic Prussian government, uh, Otto von Bismarck, opposing the French, and this led into World War I. And this, I look at it as, as one thing leads to another in history, it's like a cycle. And you get one thing, and then it's, re, and then the response is another thing, response is another thing, and it keeps going. So, um, but that was, it was inevitable. It was inevitable. Uh, Napoleon wandering around in, in Europe, was a product of the French Revolution. Yeah, my my grandmother was a, a a fairly good historian as well. And you may remember, if you studied history, there was this thing called the Hundred Years' War, way way back during the the late Middle Ages. My grandmother said that the in the distant future, a couple maybe a couple hundred years from now, people will look back on this period and call from Napoleon to Hitler the Hundred Fifty Years' War. Yeah. That it, 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 they all segued one into the other, into the other, into the other. Yep. And that's, I, I agree with her. I absolutely agree with that. I do. I do. So, Mike, what do you think of Napoleon? Well, you, you have multiple takes on Napoleon, depending on where you live. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, b believe it or not, um, he, he's considered a hero in Italy and Slovenia. Um, in fact, Slovenia has got a, a monument to him in Ljubljana, the capital, because he had created the Illyrian uh, provinces, which, because Napoleon was many things. One, he was a military engineer, a brilliant military engineer, a strategist, mathematician, and a philosopher and administrator. And he did believe in some of the tenets of republicanism and the seeds of Republican Europe, small r, came from Napoleon. Because when he would come to these countries, with a few exceptions, he would bring up these ideas of, because he was looking to destabilize the monarchs that he was at war with, he would, he would bring in these ideas of republicanism. 
So, um, you know, depending on where you like in Poland, Napoleon is, you know, viewed positively because he re he created the Grand Duchy of Warsaw, which basically put Poland back on the map. So depending on your perspective and where you live, uh, Napoleon was a, was a great guy. Uh, the, you know, he's ethnically Italian. You know, Corsica was an Italian province uh, mm -hmm. for the longest time. And, you know, his name got Francified. It was, it was a slightly different in the, what he was born under. So it, it's, um, I mean, Louisiana, I mean, Napoleon was a, had a big hand in creating a strong United States to the Louisiana Purchase. And that was part of his aim. He sold Louisiana not just to get money and not just because he couldn't control it, but he saw that he was planting the seeds of a rivalry with the British uh, that would one day overtake the United uh, Great Britain. So he was cognizant of what he was doing when he allowed America to have hegemony over the North American continent. So Napoleon's a complicated figure. I mean, certainly a warlord in, in prior to World War I and the rise of Hitler and Stalin, the biggest butcher in, in Europe since the Mongols, but uh, hit, hit the East, but he did bring some innovations with him. And, um, and I mean, Napoleon was a scientist. He was an archeologist. You know, was, uh, through his campaigns in Egypt is where we got the Rosetta Stone, which the yeah. British then s swiped and put in their museum. So, um, you know, Napoleon was more akin to say Alexander the Great than any other contemporary because he, you know, he, he was a scientist as well as a warrior as well as a, uh, a mathematician and, and, and a political philosopher. I mean, he was an administrator. So, um, and Napoleon, uh, you gotta remember, tampered, uh, moder uh, moder had a moderating influence on the French Revolution. He allowed the church to come back in France. Um, he also kidnapped the Pope, but that's another story altogether, but, he crowned himself, all that good stuff, you know. No, you know that, but, yeah, but, but, take but that, the, the, bishops. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, the court, Just well, the crown coronation, yourself, Kurt. <laughs> well, the, the coronation, most people realize this, the coronation where he was going to take the crown from the Pope was planned. The Pope knew that was coming. Mm -hmm. you know, that, was, that, that was not something he just did as a spur of the moment act. So, uh, but Napoleon is a much more, in fact, I, even got a little on my desk, got a little uh, figurine of Napoleon from the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> but, uh, and that's but, the battle you chose? A figurine well, that's where they the sold Battle of the Waterloo? <laughs> well, that's where, they, that's where they sold the souvenir. I mean, okay, I, I, yeah, of course. I, I, I mean, you know, it's... <laughs> I'm joking. You know, but, but, but... I mean, You're look, in New Orleans, we, Mike. You're in New Orleans, I mean, Napoleon, I bet they kind of dig him down there, don't they? I mean, well, does a New Orleans they think the, of themselves got, more French than anything, well, even though they've been ruled well, by many? Well, you've got the, the, the bar, the Napoleon house, which legend has it, was supposed to be where he was going to live after a bunch of pirates sprung him from the island of St. Helena. And let's talk about that. He kept, he's a big survivor because they kept putting him away. He kept escaping. Well, <laughs> well, 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 I mean, you he, have to admire the guy for that. And he was only four foot escaped, nothing. He only escaped once. I mean, the second time he didn't escape, <laughs> he died. You know, it may have even been poisoned. But, uh, but you know, we've got one of Napoleon's death masks in New Orleans. Wow. In the Cabildo Museum. So... Uh, but look, if you go to Rome, there's a huge museum to Napoleon in Rome, uh, not far. Now, why would that be? Explain that to me. Why would that be? Or is there? Well, you know, you've no, just got everything. Napoleon, in Rome. Napoleon was president of Italy. You know, that was one of the titles he gave himself. And, <laughs> I, um, I know, but and installed some of his relatives all over Italy. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. He, had, he had his brother. Uh, we call him Joe Bottles, the king of uh, Spain, who was perpetually drunk. He had one of his brothers. What's wrong king. with that? <laughs> well, you can, I mean, if you can be a king, if you can be a monarch and be drunk all the time, it's not a bad job. He was, well, he wasn't, wasn't a very good one. That's why he didn't last very long. Wasn't um, Joe Bottles <laughs> one of the guys in the opening scene of Goodfellas? I knew someone was going to say that. Yeah, probably. <laughs> he had uh, one of his brothers was the, uh, was the king of the Netherlands, and his brother-in-law was king of 
uh, was it uh, Southern Italy, uh, Naples. Naples, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So and, as Mel Brooks the, said, it's good to be the king. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, so, you know, he was installing his relatives everywhere. One, and, not nepotism, it works, usually. Not always, but usually. Well, so, you know, it, I, it, didn't, it didn't work out too well because some of Napoleon's relatives plotted against him. Oh, wow. Well, so, it's always that family his drama. Relatives. So, you know. But he survived uh, for the most part. I mean, you know, he just, don't you think he, you know, he ended up uh, going down because he's, he just got cocky. I mean, and that's what happens. They start thinking they can do anything and you go to, you go all the way where Waterloo was. Why would you ever do that? Why well, would you think you could survive that? Well, Water, Waterloo was, was on the comeback. He, Waterloo was ne, was a necessity. He went to Waterloo because he needed to defeat one of the armies before it could link up with the other army. That was the secret to Napoleon strategically. He would try to he would try to separate armies, overwhelm one, and then go after the other one uh, as a separate unit. Uh, Leipzig and and Moscow was the two areas where he got beat. Yeah. Uh, Moscow. Moscow and then the German, uh, the German, the defeat of the Battle of the Nations right outside Berlin and Leipzig. Uh, one of the largest war monuments in the world is constructed there, and yeah. um, that's where that's where Napoleon got his back broken because at that point it was game over. Uh, all of Europe was coming for him, and he was, you know, and he kept turning down deals that would have kept him on the throne. The Austrians. Because Napoleon's brother-in-law was uh, the the king of Austria, uh, Emperor of Austria, because Napoleon's second uh, wife, the Empress uh, Marie Louise, was an Austrian, and um, she's buried in Vienna. But uh, but yep, she has his our grave. Yeah, I've seen but, that. Yeah, it's in the uh, Kaisergruft where they have all the royal the the, uh -huh. the uh, Habsburgs. Uh, but that's also where Emperor Maximilian from the the Battle of Puebla and the Mexican French. Uh, Here we uh, go, full circle. <laughs> yeah, it's the fact he's got the, it always uh, is. I Mexican, know, isn't he's it? Got Me he's got Mexican flag bunting on his uh, tomb. Mm. So uh, to this, yeah. the fact that people leave flowers there for him. So, but so oh. Napole Napoleon was an interesting figure, and and, and he, I mean, he was. The most consequential figure, I would say, in Europe, between Winston Churchill and um, oof, uh, prior to Napoleon, uh, I would say. Um, what do you think, Kurt? Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther. Would... Martin would... Luther. Yeah, I well, that, uh, that would be a societal difference. I might go all the way back to Charlemagne in terms. I of was going to agree with you. Yeah, I was in, 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 in that, terms yeah. of both military, political, and all of that. I, I remember, oh, by the way, I the picture I have behind me here is me in the British Museum with the stolen Rosetta Stone. Oh, nice. <laughs> I got uh, yelled at for trying to when, touch when, it. When I, I was there, <laughs> I was lecturing on it uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I remember seeing a cliff notes of the cliff notes of war and peace. War and peace in eight words. France invaded, it snowed, France retreated, Russia won. Mm. You know, you know Foreign Russia's in eight words. You know okay. Russia's uh you know Russia's three greatest generals? December, January, and February. Ah, <laughs> good one. That's, that's true. That's absolutely yeah. true. That's I mean, he gave up the high ground. I you know, I was surprised because uh, you know, look, you Sometimes, you know, the bad guys or people don't do as well. And they, you, like, you have to admire Napoleon, though. I mean, you know, for how well, intelligent did. he was. And it just, you have to admire the guy. I do. Well, I mean, from well, what I've read Winston, about him. Winston Churchill did. If you go to his desk at Chartwell, he's got a small bust of um, of the Duke of Wellington, but he's got a much larger bust of Napoleon mm -hmm. on his desk. So here you have the British prime minister with this enormous bust of Napoleon and a much smaller <laughs> A monument to uh, to um, to you know, the British leader, the guy who defeated Napoleon, uh, Duke, the Duke of Wellington. So I mean, I got a question for you. Sure. Wasn't Churchill related to Wellington? No, that's Marlborough. It, uh, it's, oh yeah, the Duke of Marlborough. Okay. 
Yeah, okay. That, that, right. that's, Blenheim, that's Blenheim Palace, which yeah. going full circle, that actually was Wayne Manor in the Dark Knight Rise and the, the Batman. <laughs> I love that. So, yeah. Mike, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that's fascinating. I never put that together. And I love that movie, but you're absolutely right about how that was basically the French Revolution storming in the Bastille and, and Bane. Well, B Bane is Bane is is Madame Defarge, if you will, yeah. and um, and he well, I guess the um, Razo Ghul's daughter would be Madame Defarge, and Bane was the muscle. But basically, it's mob rule. W what did you have during the French Revolution? People storming mob Versailles, rule. looting things. What did you have in uh, Dark Knight Rises? The 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 hoi polloi breaking into the wealthy people's houses. Making off with their booze and and they're and they're throwing them out of their <laughs> good homes choice. And, I'm glad they at least picked yeah. the best treasure to pick up. I mean, they 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 they, they took the carpets and they, they took the furs and but I mean it is modeled after the French. In fact, Nolan admits it. It's modeled after the French Revolution. I'm so glad you brought that up because you know so many people don't know their history. I mean, they don't know anything. I did. So I didn't bad. know that about that building. I did not know but, that about that. But, but, so but that's what I love about it. Really jumps out at you. Is when they're doing the, the mock trial with the scarecrow as the judge. Agree, agree. And, and he's sentencing everyone. That, that's what you had during the French Revolution. You had the tribunals, and of course, everyone was always guilty. Yeah, uh, always. Now, rather than using a yeah. guillotine, they would sentence them to exile, which they'd have to walk across the the, fr the partially frozen river, and the people would fall through and die. Mm. So yep. there's, I guess, a cleaner version of the guillotine. But but no, that that was. I mean, that is essentially where uh nolan got got his uh, well no or whoever was the script writer got he wrote the premise of bane running gotham it's based off of revolutionary france but and, that's and great because way, kids that don't want to read any history at least they can watch it i mean it, you know make that reference so that's 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 brilliant of you to make that comparison and correlation so maybe some Joker? kids can understand it well, that's one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of the musical Hamilton. Uh, the, the, what most people don't realize, particularly on the right, they, they get stuck with the cast, the casting, but the, the entire premise of the show was to, was to convey ownership of the American Revolution to non-whites, people who may not be of English stock, uh, to, to, to understand that the, the values the ideals of Hamilton and Jefferson and Washington are transcendent. They're not, they're not connected via blood. They're collected, they're, they're connected via spirit. And that's one of the, the genius parts of Hamilton was that it helps introduce these concepts in these people's lives and this and what drove them to a generation that may not see that they have a connection. You know, they see these as old dead that old dead white men when really i mean by, by the casting devices they use they help these th these young people understand that there is a connection and big fan of hamilton i've seen it five times but wow. that's where that's where we've uh that's where i think we need to do a better job i agree selling history because yeah. we, we, we just we treat it as if it's something that that that's that people are excluded from and as I tell people, so look, George Washington is is everyone's is the father of our country, and he's the father of all Americans. He is whether you're white, black, whether you got any English blood or not, he's everyone's father of this country. Well, he was that. from the Caribbean, and he migrated yeah. to New York, I think. Yeah, yeah. and he was a he was a uh, basically a bastard child. Yeah. yeah, he was a clerk. So, and, and, yeah. Uh, and, uh, well, and, and, but that's one of the things about, I know we're, we are so far off of Bastille Day. No, no, we always do this. Don't worry. Don't we always do but, this? We're lucky this, to this spend five minutes. This is our regular minutes. thing. This is our We're lucky to spend thing. five minutes on a thing. Believe me, this but, is better, but, uh, always better than most. One of, my, <laughs> one of my criticisms of Hamilton is they do use some words a little bit too interchangeable th than they should. You can't say Hamilton was an immigrant because technically speaking, you know, all of the colonies were separate. They were all British, but there was no difference between going from Virginia to New York than it was from going from the Caribbean 
a British colony in the Caribbean to New York. There was no America. That there point, was the sure. colony of New York. And Lafayette was not an immigrant. He was he was a volunteer. He came here to fight and mm-hmm. then he left. Immigrants yep. stay. They try to be a part of the new country. That's Lafayette true. Was, Lafayette was offered generous land grants throughout the United States, which he happily accepted, never set foot on them, sold it and pocketed the money, which, you know, <laughs> Which, I mean, he wasn't coming here. This guy, this guy had a big palace, you know. Or yeah, he's going here. back to France, and no, he should. He's going back to France. He's going of back course. to the world he knew. But you know, most people know this. There are only two portraits hanging in the U.S. House of Representatives chamber: Washington on the left, Lafayette on the right. Yep, and I've seen them both. It, it's and, always and, funny to me to think of the American Revolution as Lafayette's study abroad program. <laughs> no, really, yeah, I mean, really, I mean, he was in, that age. I mean, that, that was the age you go away for a wow. year or two and co- then you come back and lead your real life. <laughs> so many of those guys were so young. Yeah. I mean, the, you had guys in their 30s and then you had these kid, these whippersnappers, Monroe, Madison, Monroe learning at the team. feet of, yeah, learning yeah. at the feet of Jefferson and Washington. See, here at my college, here at Ivy Tech this semester, we had an innovative English comp class that was designed to uh, be built around the themes from Hamilton. So the students were not only learning how to read and write, but they were learning specifically about the things that were coming out of that. I was fortunate enough to get three of the cast members to do little cameo video kinds of things for the class. So so that, that turned out to be really, really good. And then our my the the same trip that I uh, went on the students with to see the Rosetta Stone, while we were in London, we went to see Hamilton, and I thought seeing Hamilton in London oh, was, was, was <laughs> particularly interesting because there there you get King George in his home on his home yeah, court. They laugh, yeah. they laugh but, at him when he's singing yeah. songs. Yeah. Oh, of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I've seen it. One of the places I've seen Hamilton was at the Victoria Theater. That's where we were. That's where oh, we were. Nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would. So, I would do you think the British? Do you all think the British think of King George as like, the, like the idiot who fucked yeah. up, or is that how? The, okay. Just wondering. The, 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 <laughs> you, have, you have two. You have two. You have two classes. One, uh, you have those who just view him as Mad King George. And by the way, there's a phenomenal movie that was based off of a play called The Madness of King George. Yeah. Uh, Star Nigel Hawthorne. Oh, yes. Yeah. Helen Mirren. It is an amazing movie. Ni- Nigel Hawthorne does a great job in it. And um, so they all knew that King George was crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, well, he, he suffered a, a physical malady that, that made him unbalanced, if you will. Uh, and, and they talk about that in the movie, which I believe one of the actors from the Hobbit movies is, uh, is, is the doctor who treats King George. In, in the madness of King George, but the 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 more learned, um, I guess um, you know, history oriented British resent King George because they there was a deal to uh, basically because the, remember the colonies did not necessarily want to go their separate way. They offered a compromise, and most people don't realize this. The British had later tardily agreed to the compromise, but it was too late. The revolution was 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 already started at that point and there was no going back. Yeah, there were and a ton they, of loyalists. They, you know, they were it, they had to flee to Canada and, you know, down to St. August, you know, whatever. I mean, it was I mean that as you all know that the yeah, that the Revolutionary War was barely won. I mean, we are damn yeah. lucky we won it. Thank well, you, it, Marquis it, de Lafayette, <laughs> by the way. Uh-huh. <laughs> and and the French fleet and a few other oh yeah, oh, yeah. Kinds of things that were there but, but, but yeah there, there are quite a number of places in London and the picture I have here actually I got a box seat for the the Hamilton show wow it, nice the, the thing is the box seat nice there actually box. comes with a butler <laughs> yeah. a butler <laughs> and, a, and a charging station I, I had I awesome had a box seat, yeah, a box yeah. seat as well uh, for Hamilton in London. But there are lots of places that in London that have blue plaques on the wall of someone famous lived there. There are any number of those that are uh, American colonists who came back after the revolution right. because they were no longer welcome. 
uh, sometimes the only because they were pro-British, but sometimes <laughs> just because they were neutral. Even even people who tried to yeah. stay neutral were not. The only yeah, house that Benjamin Franklin lived in that's still standing is in London. They have yeah. a museum yeah. dedicated to Benjamin Franklin. That's a that that's actually live action. So it's an interpretive living history museum with sound and, and lighting and it, it, it's one of the it's a really great interpretive center and it's not far off of west end where all of the theaters are and, and he was a uh, francophile right i mean he he, he got was along with the french, french. Yeah. yeah he, he, he was, got along with the french he had a bunch of girlfriends there too yeah, yeah, yeah. He, oh, he, yeah. He, was more, he was more of a he was more of a franco lover than a francophile i mean, okay. he, 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 <laughs> I, mean, I, mean I mean look i mean Franklin tried to negotiate with, with, with the British, and yeah. that's when he had his infamous trip to the Privy Council, where they embarrassed him and dressed him down, and when he walked out of there, he walked in there a British subject, he walked out of there a, a revolution. An American. Because of, <laughs> yeah. well, because a patriot. Because well, they screwed Franklin, it up. I mean, look, it, it could have worked out. They screwed it up. Thank goodness. And, uh, you know, and the French helped us. And here we are at the end of the show. Well, so yeah. the French, the, the in Dutch, present day yeah. that we can be very, very, very happy with the French. And, you know, I've said this a few times. I always give the French a pass because they saved us during the Re American Revolution. We could not have won, in my opinion. I, I think everyone's well, opinion. We could not well, have won without the help of the French. Well, well you uh, remember Schoolhouse Rock. We had the Spanish and we had the Dutch as well. <laughs> well, they the helped first, too, but and, the French the first country really came to recognize help. America were the Dutch. Yeah, yeah the Dutch but, did too, big time. Yeah, but not yeah. like the French. It, the, it's really interesting to me how many things that we don't know who helped what and when. We talk about the French because they were there. I mean, obvious, but... But the Spanish were helping on the backside. I mean, down south where Mike's yeah. from, hey, yeah. the, the huge, yeah. huge help. No doubt well, about it. I Dutch too. I mean, but the that. French really came through, you know, and plus yeah. since he, I think because he went so close to Washington and, you yeah. know, they were advising each other's eye, you know, that's, it's just, you know, yeah. Marquis de Lafayette, he definitely deserved that land and he deserved to be able to sell it and go back to France <laughs> to me and his palace. Well, he deserved to it. Me it's, <laughs> to me, it's interesting because I'm going to use a geopolitical view they hated the British. So anything they could do to mess well, them yeah. up, they would do it. That's and that true. Was what sure. it was about. That was a long feud. If you well, I don't know, maybe the longest people, feud in the world. Yeah, where the, I think where it was. The, where, the, where the American Revolution ties back into the French Revolution is that <clears throat> Louis the Sixteenth was so broke by financing the American Revolution mm -hmm. that, that caused a lot of the economic crises that led to the rioting, which led to you know him exactly true being, being yeah. deposed and later executed so if, i mean i mean lewis I, i'm very if you ever go to washington dc that that area where they got the statue equestrian statue of andrew jackson mm -hmm. what's that, uh, that park that, that's the north side of the white house yeah mm -hmm. um, that faces left. you have statues of four foreign uh uh revolutionary figures you have uh, Lafayette, I think you've got Rochambeau, uh, I think Kuziescu, and, or maybe von Steuben or, or, or Pulaski. I forgot. No, it's not It's not Kuziescu. He's on the other side. It's Pulaski, and I think it's... Um, you got to have von Steuben. <laughs> I, think, yeah. I think it's von Steuben, yeah. <laughs> and... And, and you have Lafayette felt, Park. You have the whole park right outside right. of the White House, Lafayette yeah, Park. Yeah. And I always thought that and if you go to Yorktown, there's a joint American French uh, monument. Uh, there community. should be. It, there should be. But I always felt that the poor guy that really came out the biggest loser and is completely unappreciated in all of this is Louis the Sixteenth, because he ended up yeah. being the guy that paid with his head, literally. Yeah. And yeah, he he took a really big risk that that I mean he he accomplished sh his short term goal, but he ended up losing everything at the mm. end of the day. Yeah, and I always he, thought it was very unfortunate that there's not more to recognize his role in all of this. And I mean, hist look, history loves winners, and they ignore losers or they hate losers. And yep. because Louis XVI lost the the revolution in his head, 
um, you know, he, he's largely, you know, denigrated, ignored when, you know, I, I wish there was something more to him uh, in this country that recognized his role in the American, and that of uh, Carlos III, the King of Spain, who yeah. you know, played a big role in, in, in helping America in the revolution. Well, let's toast them. You know, we've got like 30 seconds left. Uh, you know what, Mike? That's a great thing to toast. We're talking about also Marie Bastille Antoinette. Day. The Austrians, uh, too. Yeah. Marie Antoinette was just, I mean, um, she was collateral damage. I mean, she should have I know, but I'm drinking people. Austrian rosé, so come on. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. everybody let's, toast. toast let's to toast to all our French helpers. Toast to yeah. Viva la France. Viva la France. Okay, there we go. Well, all great right. show, everybody. I have to tell you, I love the history stuff. And Mike, you're great. Everybody, how much fun. I, I had a ball. I mean, if you all don't like history, tune in Very this one. But I thought that this was a great show i love it yeah. we should know our history I better and yeah. bastille he, day he, 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 he the history channel. Yeah. You, you'll, you'll branch out into the history channel now sure why not drinks with <laughs> you are all it. in we're all going <laughs> it's my, all right cheers thing. everybody history's my thing here's uh, au, au revoir au revoir, au revoir. <laughs> i gotta go we i'll be here to say